Hey guys, today we will be discussing a video I found by YouTube user Titus Azaria titled, Four Gaps Atheistic Evolution Fails to Bridge. In this video, a man by the name of L.T. Jayachandran, or L.T. for short, is giving a presentation about four gaps that evolution will never be able to explain. We're going to do something a little bit different for this video. There won't be an idiot counter for this video. Instead, we will be counting the number of times LT commits a logical fallacy to support his assertion. But the idiot counter will return for the next video. So let's begin. People like Richard Dawkins, uh, atheistic evolutionists, they say that Christians are um, create God of the gaps. And he's partly correct. So the God of the gaps argument has a pretty simple definition. For every observation that science has yet to come up with a logical and valid explanation for, theists will simply state that God did it, even though there is a lack of evidence to support this claim. So basically the God of the gaps argument is a way for theists to supplant the ignorances in science with a theistic explanation. Before science began to expand, what Christians used to do, God did it. And as our knowledge expanded, the gaps shrank and the God inside the gap also began to shrink. The problem with the God of the gaps argument is that it only works for phenomena that have yet to be explained by science. As LT stated, as science grows, the gaps begin to shrink. Theists rely on this argument because it is most likely that humans will never completely understand every aspect of our universe. So as long as a single gap exists, an excuse for an illogical belief in a god also exists. So I am suggesting to you, I mean this is a conclusion to which I have come, uh, that there are four gaps which are different from other gaps. You can call them uh, unbridgeable gaps gaps in kind because they do not belong to the same kind of a knowledge. So when LT speaks of these four gaps belonging to a different kind of knowledge, he will be speaking of gaps that cannot be explained definitively by science. However, making the assertion that these gaps are unbridgeable gaps is an argument from incredulity. Now he's completely wrong with two of the gaps, but the other two require a more philosophical explanation. Now as most of you know by now, philosophy is not my strong point. So I will do the best to explain why I don't agree with these assumptions, and if I make a mistake or could have explained something better, please feel free to let me know in the comments below. So let's continue. My first gap, how does something come out of nothing? Okay, so the easy one first. This argument is a straw man defense against a randomly created universe due to the Big Bang. Nowhere in our explanation of the universe do we say that something came from nothing. We see the universe in three dimensions, we experience the universe in four, and if you're only taking those four dimensions into account, then by all means you have just created something from nothing. However, our understanding of the universe has already expanded beyond the idea that there was nothing before the universe began. Now I'm not familiar with LT's beliefs outside of this video, so I'm not sure whether he's a young earth creationist or someone who accepts the age of the universe but believes it was all by the will of a god. Either way, his assumption that nothing existed before the universe did is not backed by any scientific evidence and can be merely disregarded as a non-scientific claim. Science is never going to be able to explain it. People who talk about the Big Bang and so on, they do not know what caused it. The Big Bang Theory is a controversial theory to discuss because it takes us back to the origin of our known universe. So accurately discussing the events leading up to the Big Bang is almost impossible, as the universe as we know it would not have begun existing yet. We can mathematically show that the Big Bang is a possibility, and at the LHC at CERN, scientists are actively trying to recreate the conditions of the Big Bang to increase our understanding of that event. To say that science will never be able to explain the Big Bang is making the assumptions that humans are simply incapable of ever attaining this level of intelligence and ingenuity, and is another argument from incredulity. I personally believe that with enough time, humans will attain a complete understanding of what initiated the Big Bang, which should provide us with more inexplicable questions, which will most certainly be answered with the God of the Gaps argument by people like LT. That is, until science completely explains those phenomena too. They are now talking about string theory, uh, God particle, uh, boson, and all that. But everything immediately assumes who created that. There's an obvious problem with this argument. 
as if everything ever created needed a creator, then who created the creator? To accept God as our creator would logically point to our God needing to accept that he could possibly have a creator as well. This results in an endless loop of necessary creators until eventually someone commits the special pleading fallacy by asserting that there is a creator who for some reason does not need to be created himself. So you have a problem. How does something come out of nothing? Secondly, how does life come from non-life? For those of you who may be students of chemistry, the line that divides organic from inorganic chemistry is a mystery. Did somebody say chemistry? In order to understand the argument that LT is trying to make here, it's important to know what the terms organic and inorganic actually mean. In chemistry, an organic chemical is simply any compound that contains carbon. However, for weird historical reasons, there are some exceptions. For example, carbon dioxide is a carbon-based molecule, yet it usually isn't considered organic. The same applies, among a few others, for carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide and the carbonate ion. This definition also excludes the different allotropes of carbon itself, as elements are not considered compounds. Therefore, diamond, graphite, graphene and a bunch of recently discovered modifications of carbon don't count either. Unlike what LT seems to believe, the clear line he's talking about is simply non-existent. The same elements which constitute inorganic chemistry in certain particular bondings become the building blocks of life. How do they do that? Organic compounds can be synthesized from organic carbon-containing molecules and ions, which has been done countless times in chemical labs since the mid-19th century. The first example was performed in 1828 by the German chemist Friedrich Wöhle, who discovered a way to synthesize urea, an organic compound, by treating ammonium chloride with silver cyanate. Not only did his discovery show that organic compounds can be synthesized from inorganic molecules, it also disproved an earlier idea called vitalism that proposed that living organisms were for some reason different from dead matter because they contained a yet unexplained life force. The idea also proposed that only living things could produce the components they contained and needed, which was shown to be false. Today, simple organic compounds are synthesized in the million tons per year scale. Methanol, for instance, is made from syngas, a mixture of hydrogen and carbon monoxide, using zinc oxide catalysts under high pressure. This is only one out of countless examples of these type of reactions showing how LT has no idea what he's talking about. Now, when talking about the formation of the first life forms, one important discovery was made by Stanley Miller and Harold Urey in 1953. They showed that simple organic compounds could be obtained by treating a hypothetical reducing atmosphere of the Earth shortly after its formation with heat, electricity and radiation. The gas mix used contained water vapor, methane, ammonia, molecular hydrogen and carbon monoxide. Among the chemicals found in the experiments were various carboxylic acids as well as some amino acids such as glycine, alpha and beta alanine, aspartic acid and so on. Amino acids make up proteins when they are combined to form long chains and are found in all life forms on this planet. The Miller-Urey experiment brilliantly demonstrated that complex compounds with carbon chains in their centers could be easily built up from simple, common predecessors under natural conditions. And even though our understanding of the early Earth's atmosphere changed over the years and Miller-Urey's model atmosphere isn't considered accurate anymore, similar experiments have been performed since then using different gas compositions yet yielding similar results. The third this is a very important gap. How does reason come from non-reason? So this is where the empirical side of his argument goes away and the philosophical side emerges. Again, bear with me as philosophy is a newer subject to me and if you notice a mistake or a better way of expressing what I am intending to say, then please feel free to let me know in a comment below. LT asserts that the nature of reason precludes it from being developed naturally through evolution. Reason is generally defined as the capacity to be rational the capacity to acquire knowledge and logically create scenarios for the past, present, and future with that knowledge. The ability to reason gives us the ability to postulate inventions or predict the future. For instance, if I ask you what you are going to eat for dinner tomorrow, you must use reason to logically deduce the impossibilities. If you are a strict vegan, then it would be unreasonable to predict that your meal will consist of meat products. Reason is a construct of the biological brain and has evolved as a way of increasing our species' chances for survival. We know it's a product of the brain, as things like drugs, emotions, and ignorance can prompt a person to do or say something unreasonable. 
Reason is directly tied to consciousness. As we take in information and facts from the world around us, reason gives us explanatory power and the ability to build predictive models that match reality. One student asked me about uh, theory of evolution. I gave this example about the third gap. How does reason come from non-reason? This is a straw man argument. Similar to the common flat earth argument that a pressurized system cannot exist next to a vacuum, so the earth must be enclosed in a container. Where the atmosphere meets the edge of space, there's only a minuscule difference in pressure. Just as with the first noticeable sign of reasoning would only be slightly more reasonable than what we would consider no reason at all. Reason is a result of natural selection. So our cognitive abilities would have developed over time, not overnight. But making the claim of reason through evolution without evidence is just as ludicrous as asserting that reason must come from God. So I found this article in the National Library of Medicine's National Institute of Health, which suggests that cognition in primates evolved within the species in a way such that species of primates who shared a similar ancestor more recently show less divergence when rating their cognitive abilities. In other words, two primate species who share a more common recent ancestor show less divergence in logical reasoning than two primate species who diverge from a common ancestor from much longer ago, suggesting that cognition or reasoning is a result of natural selection and not bestowed upon primates by a divine being. And there is nothing to suggest that humans didn't acquire logical reasoning through a similar process. Because if everything is chaos and suddenly uh, we become uh, intelligent beings. I gave this example. Uh, if a lightning hits the Bay of Bengal and a laptop is washed ashore and your evolutionist friend says, you know, this is the lightning caused the laptop. That is an awful example and a complete non sequitur. In my opinion, this comparison is actually evidence that anti-evolutionists display a lack of reasoning in their arguments. To start, there is no logical way that a lightning strike could be responsible for the instantaneous creation of a complex system of complex parts. The theory of evolution suggests that our macroevolution is constructed of microevolutions since the first signs of life on Earth. This is a completely plausible explanation for not just human life, but most life on our planet, and we have evidence to back it. But you use a laptop because its hardware was designed and constructed by intelligent people. Its software was written by intelligent people. What exactly does this have to do with humans having the ability to reason? A laptop can't reason. If you show every person on earth the same painting, for instance, each person would rationalize their personal beliefs about that painting. A computer will react to inputs given a set of programmed rules, and all similar laptops will react to the inputs in the exact same programmed way. Again, this is just another non sequitur. Reason must come from reason at every stage. C.S. Lewis puts it, it doesn't matter how long back you go, the moment you say reason comes from non-reason, you must say stop, because all thinking gets discredited. No. All thinking does not become discredited because we track reason back to a starting point. This is tantamount to saying that tracking the evolution of the eye to the early Cambrian period, but not before the Cambrian period, discredits sight as we have evidence that there was a time when non-sight existed. Reason, as with eyesight, is a product of natural selection. Then my fourth uh, gap, how does morality come from non-morality? How do you distinguish by uh, right and wrong? <laughs> so the arguments for the origins of morality follow the same explanations as the origins of reason. Most likely, morality is an evolutionary trait that began with the evolution of reason. As our ability to reason increased, our morality grew. Morality comes from our sense of self and is the basis for such sayings as, do unto others as you'd want them to do unto you. Morality is also dependent on environmental, societal, and situational influences. Was it immoral for the survivors of Uruguayan Flight 571 to cannibalize their dead friends so they didn't die themselves? And do the same moral standards regarding cannibalism apply in a non-life-threatening ordeal? Morality can also evolve with society. When we lived in small groups consisting mostly of family, we were nice to those around us because they were around us all the time, and we desired the reciprocation of positive moral support. 
As a society began to grow and families joined with other families to form communities, morality helped us to define rules and laws that were beneficial to the community as a whole. For instance, by creating a law ensuring that no one in the community steals from anyone else, you are in essence reinforcing the golden rule throughout society. And as the dynamics of a growing or shrinking society changes, so does the moral standards of that society. The concept of slavery is a good example of this. While today we all find slavery to be morally reprehensible, there was a time when it was morally acceptable. I believe this to be evidence that the evolution of morality is directly linked to the evolution of reasoning and can be influenced by both natural and artificial selection because the evolution of reasoning or logic directly evolves the development of our moral standards. Why I am confident that the God of the Bible fills all these gaps. First of all, he is eternal, whereas nature is finite. This has absolutely no relevance to the arguments against evolution. Another non sequitur. So because he exists forever, he can create something out of nothing. Well, that's just stupid. How does the length of his existence determine his ability to violate laws of conservation? That's a non sequitur as well. Secondly, because he is the living God, he can create life. Exactly how and by what means does being the living God give him the power to create life from non-life? The non sequitur show should really consider hiring LT as their living mascot. Thirdly, because he is the Logos. All things were made by the Logos, so reason can come from Logos. The idea of the Logos is a new concept to me, and as I understand it, the Logos is what gives form and beauty to the universe. This is an ad hoc version of the God of the Gaps argument. When LT can't conceive of how reason can possibly evolve from non-reason, he and others like him just assign God or the Logos to explain their ignorances. Fourthly, he is a God of holiness. And so when he makes you and me in his image, he makes us capable of moral decisions. Do you mean like the moral decisions of the Catholic Church to cover up allegations of sexual misconduct? Or how about the morals of all the people who have committed atrocities and murdered millions of people in the name of God throughout history? And I would think that the people in hell would disagree with God's capability to make moral decisions, especially when one of the sins a man can be condemned to an eternity in hell for is simply being open-minded about the validity of God, completely disregarding all the good one may have done for humanity as a whole. Well, that's it for today, guys. It's quite obvious to me that anti-evolutionists like LT have built their beliefs on fallacious evidence. Be sure to hit the like button, subscribe to both my channel and GeoStriber's channel, and click the little dinger to stay informed with our content. And don't forget to leave a comment telling me what you think about my first anti-anti-evolution video. I'm Father Skeptic, and I'm out.